Hello, welcome to God Day. I'm Sarah Tan. Today's topic is speaking life. Ah, life in all its abundance, as opposed to death. Society is pulling us down sometimes. Things that are going on in the world might make us feel negative or overcome. There's lots of things on the news that cause us to be concerned. But over all that, arching beyond that, is God our Creator who knew all these things were going to come to pass. And I'm speaking life. L'chaim, as the Hebrew people, speakers say. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. If there's only one scripture you remember today, may it be John 10, 10. I've come for abundant life, for mankind, for the Jews, for those saved. It depends on your perspective of the continuum of time and when you read scripture. Jesus came to save anyone in the world and everyone in the world. And even though not all give their lives to him, he makes the world a better place from his teaching and his spirit, because the spirit gives life. And Jesus' teaching gives life. Look at our societies who follow the gospel, who follow the Judeo-Christian rules and laws. They have been blessed through history. Life is a blessing. And how is this life given? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's Zechariah 4, verse 6. Life, abundant life, comes through Jesus. God ordains life. He breathes his spirit into humanity, so we have a richer, more sophisticated, more full life because we have the spirit in us. Though without repentance, that spirit is not really alive. It's dead. So that life, abundant life, comes from salvation but it also comes from following Jesus beyond the moment of salvation. Now, less flattering about life from Psalm 77, verse two and three. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Now, I've looked at that psalm many times, but most recently when I look at it, I see it's not just that I wasn't comforted. My soul, I chose not to be comforted, is what the psalmist is saying. I remembered God, but I was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. What we say, how we think, is a huge factor in whether or not we live life abundantly. Whether or not we are filled and full of the spirit. We can grieve the spirit with our negativity. And that spirit just doesn't go away, but it quiets. Speaking life, then, doesn't just mean looking at the word or walking in joy. What we say and what we focus on determines to a huge degree whether we are 
walking in abundant life. What are those who are seriously ill told? Be positive. Think positively. Overcoming is not just by the spirit, and it's certainly not just by medicine. Our attitude plays its part. We can choose to reap the consequences of this tormented dis situation and refuse to be comforted. We can complain about our situation. I think of Jonah. Well, I don't want to go and talk to the Ninevites because you're going to save them. Hmm. I'm going to Tarshish. Well, eventually, the, spit, the fish spits him out. He comes back to land. He goes to Tarshish. But what's he do at the end? He sits and moans, see, I told you you'd save them. His soul refused to be comforted. He complained. And perhaps his spirit was overwhelmed. We don't know what happened next, because that's the end of the writer of Jonah. But we can see our attitude plays a huge part in our earthly life. That means too what we speak really matters. Look at Proverbs 31. Now Proverbs 31 is the one that really addresses women and blesses women. So in verse 25, 6, it says, Strength and honor were her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. This woman speaks, thinks, worships God. How she walks, plays out her daily life, is in honor. What does she do? She's rejoicing all the time. She opens her mouth and speaks wise words and kind words. And so what we say matters. Life and death are in the tongue. You know, how is the earth? How is the universe as we know it? How was it created? God spoke. The power of the tongue. What is the, the, it's bridled and all of that business. Um, I don't think I have that here. No, I didn't include that in my notes. But about the bridling of the tongue, James talks about how we need to curb what we say. We have a choice. Now, how would Satan like us to speak and think? That thief who steals life, who stole from Adam and Eve their mortality, immortality. How does the thief want us to speak? He speaks death, as opposed to Jesus, who always offers hope in all circumstances. How does the thief like us to speak and what does he offer us? Despair. What does Jesus say? He offers joy. Don't worry about what you wear, what you're going to eat. God will provide. Doesn't he love the birds and the fish and creatures? How much more does he love mankind? He will provide. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, that scripture is, I believe, from Nehemiah. It's Old Testament scripture. It's not even New Testament scripture. Joy is throughout scripture. It's not just the joy of salvation that Jesus brings. It's the joy of the Lord being our strength in all circumstances. What does the thief want us to dwell on? What does he do to our minds? He brings fear. He brings death. He brings despair. He brings fear. 
What does Jesus offer instead of fear? Excitement. He offers hope and joy and excitement. This life we live, this life, this existence we live on earth is a choice how we live it, no matter our circumstances. Paul talks about, I rejoice in all circumstances. He says, whether I'm here with you or whether I'm with him in heaven, I think it's good if I'm here with you. I'm still useful, but I'll do whatever. I'll be wherever. Because this journey is full of surprises and excitement. And what does the thief offer us? Anxiety. Let's worry about the outcome of this exam or this interview or that encounter or even that romantic date. Oh, what should I wear? What should I do? How should I behave? What does Jesus offer? Purity. Think about the other person when you go for that interview. What do they need that you can fulfill? You may not talk about Jesus. You may not talk even about their needs, but you know in that job interview, they need somebody to fulfill a position. And if they're law-abiding, honest employers, they need somebody who's honest and law-abiding and trustworthy, somebody that they can give responsibility to and they will complete the task, or somebody to watch over, manage other people to ensure they will complete the task. They want that employer needs somebody who's trustworthy and reliable. Are you that person? How can you convey, I'm trustworthy and reliable, without saying, I'm trustworthy and reliable? No, you give them a scenario. If they ask, how can, you know, what, what would be the, um, what would be the single most thing you can explain to us that would encourage us to hire you? So you think of something where you were in a circumstances once where somebody trusted you. It might be an employment situation. It might not even be an employment situation. It might be when you rescued um, that child from running out in front of the road. You didn't know the child, but you grabbed that child. You, the, the, he'd run ahead of his mom. You grabbed the child, give the child back, that demonstrates trustworthiness. And it demonstrates the sort of character you are and the sort of um, world you're operating in. You, you observe things. You're not looking in your phone walking down the street. Employers don't like people on their phones. That's for sure. <laughs> but I digress. The point is, whatever's making us anxious or fearful, or full of despair or worried about death, the Lord offers purity, excitement, joy, and hope. So, such is our life. Hope, joy, excitement, purity, if we choose. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the facts of life for a moment. Now, I just talked about purity and I've talked about husbands and wives, but it's not those facts of life I'm going to talk about. There are five A facts. We get an A star if we live this life following these facts. And I'm not saying that God has a tick box and is grading us. I don't mean that. I'm just trying to be lighthearted. Five A facts of life with Jesus. Number one attitude. And I've addressed this. Having an attitude of life, bringing life to others, having an attitude that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Knowing Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, and all things are going to work out. Having an attitude like that brings vitality, vitality to our life. The effort we put in will be energetic. 
Now, if we have an attitude of life toward being a parent and looking after our child, yes, sometimes we're tired. Sometimes that child has pulled all our strings and are, we're wanting to tear our hair out. <laughs> but it's all in perspective. So let's say you're in a shop and your child is holding on to this toy and doesn't want to let go. And it's lunchtime or it's end of school time and this one's a toddler and you've got to go get your six-year-old from school and they don't wait at the gate long. And if you are late, the child's going to cry. They don't want to be the last child collected. If you have an attitude of vitality, you think, how am I going to provoke my child to distraction so I can get that toy back, put it back on the shelf, because it's 450 pounds. <laughs> and why on earth did you shop at Hamley's? <laughs> don't shop at Hamley's unless you've got a lot of money to spend or a very cooperative child or a brilliant strategy to distract them away from things that you just can't afford or would be foolish to buy. Everybody's circumstance is different. An attitude of vitality. Son, look over here at this car. And you grab the toy as he walks by. Now, how you encounter or deal with an encounter with a small child, different from a middle child, different from a teenager. And you're not going to distract your teenager very easily, are you? They're going to be much more determined to focus on what they want to focus on. They have a will and they have an attention span and they might be playing computer games or watching television or they might be studying but whatever they're focused on that's what they want to focus on so you don't treat them the same way but do you say to them you're not listening to me I don't like your attitude or that's speaking death or do you speak life you say, I need your attention now because the house is on fire, if it's on fire. Or you gauge, what's my attitude to my teen? Do I respect them? Do I trust them? Are they worthy of that trust and respect? Can I wait until their attitude's good? And rather than say, right now, I don't like your attitude, wait till they're offering to do something in the house. You say, gee, I love your attitude. That's speaking life. Speaking life is waiting for the moment to give life to somebody rather than death. Because you certainly want to hear life from the Lord. With our children, we are God until they put something else. Hopefully it's the Lord in the role of dictating and leadership in their lives. Certainly to a small child, you are God's representative. Throughout your life, you will always be God's representative at any age. But whether you are God in their heads certainly depends on age and relationship. You want them to have a positive attitude toward you and toward God. So find ways to have a positive attitude toward your child. And yes, there will be times when they need to be scolded. Absolutely. Spare the rod and spoil the child. That's scripture. I'm not suggesting we use the rod. I'm not suggesting anything about how to raise your children or discipline your children. I'm just saying that if we want to sow life in our lives and we want life in our lives, then we need to sow life in our children's lives as well. But I digressed a little bit. So A is attitude, A number one. A number two, 
This is for all. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all equal. We all have equality. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. You're not alone. Galatians 3, 28. <clears throat> so there's no feeling sorry for yourself. You're not alone. There might be times when the Lord wants you and your attention for himself, for good reason, either to prepare you for ministry, to train you and teach you, to convict you, to love you, pour out love on you, give you the attention you really need and aren't receiving in the world. So there are times when he wants to take you in seclusion with him. But ultimately, we have fellowship. Sometimes in persecuted nations where our faith needs to be hidden, it can be hard to find other people who believe. God will provide our every need. He gives our, our heart's desire. So we are not alone. We are not alone. The third A, adoration. We worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We worship the Lord. We thank the Lord. We give thanks to him. Part of our life as a believer is to worship him. It can be a quiet prayer of thanks. It can be dancing. It can be raising our hands. It can be shouting for joy. It can be singing a song or playing on an instrument. It can be driving our cars, saying, Lord, sit next to me. Or, Lord, I need to physically drive this car, but I want you to take me where you want me to go. It can be in our workplace, worshiping the Lord, with music or without, with sounds without. Our, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We can find ways to worship the Lord. Give him adoration. And do you know what that does? It frees us up. It puts a focus on him, and therefore we have a focus. But we be, lose our inhibitions when we worship. It lifts us out of self-consciousness and gives us freedom. So when our eyes are upward, when our eyes are outward, very different from when our eyes are inward. So living life with Jesus changes our attitude, ensures we have fellowship, it's for all, and we're called to adore him. We're called to obey, but we're also called to adore him. In our journey, as we celebrate, we are lifted up. Remember, in Psalm 77, his soul refused to be comforted. If you look at Psalm 74, verse 20, have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. But if you focus on the covenant, the promises of God, we know the earth has degradation and death and sin. But we focus on the covenant, his promises to us in our worship, and that lifts us from the dark places. It elevates us. It helps us to walk on water. A number five, or four, sorry, apply, application. We need to take these worships. We need to take this fellowship. We need to take this attitude and apply it 
In all things acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. That's Proverbs 3, 6. All things, no matter the circumstance, God is in control. And when we trust him, that circumstance will change. Our attitude to it will change. And his outcome will be acceptable to us because we've surrendered it to him. Very quick story. There's a, there was a company who was forced, their bank, their bank account was forced to be closed and there's a lot on the news right now about all these things, but it was a Christian organization. They couldn't fundraise, they couldn't do anything. They ended up having to take, go to court in order to secure who was right, who was wrong. And Barclays Bank paid this organization 20,000 pounds in compensation for their error. When you trust the Lord through the situation, he can deliver out of the situation. And finally, admission. We need to confess when we're wrong. We need to know that his light brings freedom into a situation. We need to engage with others and allow the Lord to engage with us and in allow uh, him through, through us, he will engage with our family. So we trust the Lord in our attitudes, in our fellowship with all, in our adoration of him, in applying what he says in his word and applying his promises in our walk. And we admit our strengths and weaknesses. Faith in Jesus provides us life-giving perspective to walk, to live full of life and speaking life into others. Bless you all.